And today we're going to look at all of the events that led up to the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things happen in that final week that Jesus Christ was here upon the earth. Jesus' ministry, as recorded in the Bible, was the last three and a half years of his, of his life upon this earth. We don't have much written in the Bible from the time he was a child up until the time he began his ministry. But at the age of 30, Jesus Christ began his public ministry and for the next three and a half years, he was upon this earth teaching, performing miracles, gathering his 12 disciples, training them. But the last week of his life, there were a lot of major events that happened during that week. And that's what I want us to look at today as we open our Bibles. I'm sure Brother Allen's going to be preaching a sermon on the resurrection this morning. I'll just touch briefly on it. But the focus of this Sunday School class is to look at what happened during the week just prior to Jesus Christ's crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. The Gospel of John, chapter 18. I'll have a word of prayer and we'll begin this lesson today. We're going to be bouncing back and forth through, through many scriptures here in the New Testament. But I want, us, I want you to have a good, clear understanding as to what happened to Jesus Christ on those last few days prior to his crucifixion. So let's have a word of prayer. And we'll get into our lesson for today. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for this time of resurrection, Lord. We celebrate the fact that you not only gave your life and died on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins, but the Lord, that you conquered death and you arose again on the third day, and you sit at the right hand of the throne of the Father, ever making intercession for us. And we thank you that we serve a living Savior. Now, Lord, help us today as we celebrate this special Resurrection Sunday. Help us as we open the Bible today and look at it. Lord, every time we open the Word, teach us something to help us to be better Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of course, the week prior to the crucifixion, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. A lot of Christians call that Palm Sunday, when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and they spread palm branches down on the ground in front of him and they, and they claimed him as the Messiah. And that was, that was the week prior to the, resurrect, to, to the crucifixion. But there's a lot of things happened during that week in between the time he entered into Jerusalem on the triumphal entry and the time that he was crucified. In John chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, we read about when Jesus went to, to the Garden of Gethsemane that Judas came and betrayed him to the, Rome, to, the, to the Jewish leaders, to the high priest and the Jewish leaders. In John chapter 18, let's read verses one and two. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. By the way, if you ever get to take a trip to the Holy Land, I got to go there in 1969 with my church in Hammond, Indiana. I'll never forget it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there are, there are eight olive trees that they claim are over 2,000 years old, and they were probably the very same olive trees that were there when Jesus Christ went to that garden to pray. If you ever get a chance to, if you, ever, you ever hear somebody going on a trip to the Holy Land, or there's a lot of times church groups gather together and they take a group of people over to the Holy Land. You can see Calvary, the place where Jesus was crucified. You can see the empty tomb. But one of the most things that impressed me the most was going to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed prior to his crucifixion. Anyway, let's read verse two. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So here we have Jesus going to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had such a disciplined life and he had such a close walk with the Father that they often knew where they could go find him in the evening when everybody else was sleeping and everybody else was resting. Often Jesus would go into the garden and pray. Well, Judas knew that because Jesus had gone there so often that he knew that that's probably where he would find him. And it was at night. You see, Jesus wanted to be around the people during the daytime when he could do the most good. But while they're sleeping, that's when he spent time praying with the Father. And he wanted to maximize his time. Instead of praying during the daytime when everybody was out and about, he wanted to be out and about with them. And after, that's what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, if that's the case, he needs to be up and about while they're up and about. But here it is at night. And Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, we know it's at night because of verse 3. It said, Judas then, 
having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Okay, so get the picture. It's nighttime. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. Judas is going to come and he's going to betray Jesus to the, the chief priests and to, the, and to, the, uh, to the, the, the Pharisees and all these Jewish leaders. And so they're getting ready to, um, so they, they grab these torches and lanterns and weapons because it's nighttime and they're going over into the garden. Then you go to John chapter 18 and verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. And they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, there are a lot of problems in what happened during this week prior to Jesus' crucifixion. There was a lot of things that were wrong, a lot of things that were done that should never have been done. The first problem we encounter is the fact that Jewish law prohibited a trial at nighttime. If you had a trial at nighttime, where is everybody at nighttime mostly sleeping at home? If you're going to have a trial, it's supposed to be a public trial and you're going to be able to gather witnesses and appear before the trial and, and to have their turn to speak. But see, they, they were trying to trap Jesus and these chief priests and, and these Jewish leaders, they came and got him at night in the garden of Gethsemane because they came with lanterns and torches and they took him to the high priest at night to be questioned. That's the first problem that they ran into. Again, according to Jewish law, it, they prohibited you from having a trial at nighttime. But that's not the only problem that happened that week. The problem number two was that Jewish law provided for a preliminary examination before a magistrate, not a Jewish priest. So already we've got two problems going on here. First, they commandeered him out of the Garden of Gethsemane and drug him to the high priest to be questioned and they weren't supposed to bring him to a high priest. They were supposed to bring him to one of the Jewish magistrates, one of the men from the Sanhedrin. The Jewish Sanhedrin was a group of 70 Jewish elders. I would liken it to our Supreme Court, okay? If you had a problem with somebody and it was a very serious problem, you would be called before the Sanhedrin and these 70 men would sit in a room in a semicircle and whoever was questioned was going to stand in the middle of the semicircle and be and ask questions by these Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. Well, it, by Jewish law, a high priest or a priest is not supposed to be questioned in somebody if there's a problem with illegality. That's supposed to be done by the Sanhedrin. So here we already have two problems right from the very outset of this thing. They're holding Jesus with, with a questioning session and a trial at night, which is illegal. And they, instead of bringing him before the Sanhedrin and the magistrates, they bring him before the high priest. Well, it, we, already we can see how that these Jews were so angered that Jesus Christ claimed to be the son of God, that they wanted to, they wanted to kill him and they wanted to get rid of him because he didn't fit the mold that they had in their mind as to who the son of God would be. You see, the Jewish leaders knew that there was a Messiah gonna come. And they were thinking that this Jewish Messiah was going to come and set up his kingdom upon the earth and deliver them out of the hands of the wicked Roman government who was in charge of, of, of the world at that time. And when Jesus came and they watched his ministry for three and a half years, and there's no talk of setting up a kingdom there's no talk about him gathering an army together. And there's no talk about him conquering the Roman Empire. So these Jewish leaders got skeptical of the fact that this must not be the Messiah. But see, what they didn't understand was Jesus is going to come and rule and reign this earth when he comes back the second time. The first time he came to be our savior. But these Jewish leaders, because Jesus didn't fit the mold of what they thought the Messiah would be. They thought the Messiah would become a conquering Jewish military hero to overthrow the wicked Roman government and, and return Jerusalem back to the control of the Jews. And when Jesus didn't do that, they said, hmm, I wonder if he's really the Messiah. I wonder if he really is the son of God. And so they, they were convinced that he wasn't. And now they wanted to do away with him because he had such a large following. Then he was taken to the high priest's palace. Look at John chapter 18 and verse 15. And Simon Peter following Jesus 
and did another, and so did another disciple that was known unto the high priest. And they went with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Okay, now here is the third problem we run into. Remember I told you there's, there's a lot of problems that happened during that week. A lot of things went on that should have never happened according to Jewish law. The third problem we run into is that no trial is ever to be held in the palace of the high priest. The Sanhedrin, that Jewish council of 70 elders I told you about, they met in a hall next to the temple. And that's where somebody would be brought in to be questioned. Nobody was to ever be brought into the palace of the high priest to be questioned. And especially at night. So we got three problems going on. They did this at night. They brought him before the high priest and they questioned him in the high priest's palace instead of an open court. Well, you can see where their anger and what they were trying to do. They were trying to get rid of Jesus Christ because they didn't, they didn't think that he was the Messiah. They didn't like the miracles that he performed. They didn't like the following that he had gathered together while he performed his ministry here upon the earth. And so now these Jewish leaders were dead set on getting him and they wanted to make sure that they did it and without any kind of problems, they did it at night. They didn't do it through the magistrates and the Sanhedrin and they did it in the palace of the high priest. So we got all kinds of problems going on here, okay? But let's continue on, it gets worse. In John chapter 18, starting in verse 19. Then the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. The high priest wanted to know about what did Jesus teach? And he's telling them, he says, everything I taught was done in a public forum. He said, people, people heard me teach. I didn't have secret meetings with people in, in closed off rooms somewhere. Every time I taught, I taught openly. Many people heard what I taught. There was no secret. I wasn't trying to do anything, you know, in secret, trying to, to teach uh, strange doctrine to people without nobody being able to call my hand on it. I taught publicly in the synagogue and in the temple where all kinds of Jews would have been there. Then look at verse 21. Jesus said, why askest thou me? Ask them that heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Jesus said, you're asking me a question that you could have asked anybody who has heard me teach. I taught openly in the synagogue, in the temple. You want to know what I taught? Ask them. They'll tell you. They were there. They heard it. There was nothing secretive. Nothing's trying to be kept from you. Then look at verse 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? So here, this officer thinks that Jesus is being a smart aleck to the high priest, and he slaps him. And Jesus said, Why'd you do that? I didn't, I, I, I'm not telling a lie. I'm telling you the truth. Why, why did you do that? It breaks my heart when I read that verse to, to think of our Savior standing there, innocently being asked questions by this high priest. And he's, he's answering the questions the best. And, and I, have, I have a problem when I read this verse. To, to, to think that Roman officers were taken slapping for no reason. But that's what our Savior did. Then they took him to Caiaphas. First they took him to Annas, who was the, the father-in-law to Caiaphas. Now they're going to take him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Look at, now we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Just a few books towards the front of the Bible. We'll read Matthew chapter 26. Starting in verse 57. Matthew 26, 57. And when they had laid hold on Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him after, off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Okay, so Peter's going into this high priest's palace. He wants to hear this questioning that's going to go on. But Peter kind of just sits off to the side where all the servants were, because he, he just wanted to observe what was going on. He didn't want to really be real conspicuous about it. Then look at verse 59. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. 
They wanted to kill him. He didn't fit their mold as a Messiah. They thought he was going to come and conquer the world and get him out of the wicked hands of the Roman government. And so now they want to kill him because he's claiming to be the son of God and the people are following him. People are believing in him and they just need to get rid of this guy. They, they wanted to put him to death. But look at verse 60. But they, and, they, and they tried to drum up some false, false witnesses, but they found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. And at the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Jesus was talking about his body. He was talking about the fact that when he gets crucified, they're going to bury him and three days later, he's going to rise again, talking about the temple of his body. They thought he was talking about the Jewish temple. And the Jewish temple was a massive structure made out of, of limestone and quarried from down in the earth. And so uh, this one false witness says that, he, that Jesus said he was able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? They want Jesus to answer the, the accusation brought against him. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether or not thou be the Christ, the son of God. He was getting mad. He wanted to hear from Jesus' lips whether or not he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. And Jesus answering unto him and said, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. And what think ye, they answered and said, he is guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy unto us thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Well, now we run into another problem here. Problem number four is that blasphemy is not a capital offense. According to Jewish law, blasphemy does not warrant a death penalty. So you could see all of the cards, so to speak, are being stacked against him. Everything is turning against Jesus Christ. They got him at night, they weren't supposed to do that. They took him to the high priest, they weren't supposed to do that. They took him to the high priest's palace for questioning, that's not supposed to happen. And now we come to the problem that they want to kill him and they're claiming him a blessing. That's what in verse 65, then the high priest rent his clothes, that means he tore his clothes. He was so angry, he just ripped his clothes and he said, he hath spoken blasphemy, and now they want to kill him. Blasphemy does not warrant the death penalty according to Jewish law. So we have another problem here. Then we have another problem is that no defender was assigned to Jesus and a guilty verdict is invalid according to Jewish law if the person does not have a defender. So you can see this, this whole thing is starting to snowball. All of these things that were done illegally all of these things that were done secretively, all these things that were done by the high priest against Jewish law, against the, the laws that the Jewish people have, and now they want to put him to death and because the high priest said that he said he, that he was a blasphemer. Well, now you can see the problems that Jesus faced during that time. The Jews wanted to kill him. Here's the problem. The Jews had no legal authority. Who was in charge of the world at that time? The Roman government. Did the Jews have the authority to put someone to death? No, only the civil authorities had the, had the right to do that. But they were so angry at Jesus Christ because he did not fit their idea of who a Messiah should be that now they would love to put him to death, but they can't because then they would end up in prison because the Roman authorities would put them in prison so now these Jews got the idea, let's get him in trouble with the Roman government. And if we can get him in trouble with the Roman government, then the Roman government would put him to death and we have accomplished everything that we're trying to do. We can't put him to death because the Jews were not in charge of the civil and moral law at that time. But the Roman government could 
punish him and sentence him to death. And so now a plan was enacted to get Jesus before the Roman government and to get them to pronounce a death sentence upon him. So therefore, they took him to the Roman authorities. The first one they took him to was Pontius Pilate. Let's go back to John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 28. So here he comes before Pontius Pilate. John 18 and verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas. Remember, he was before the high priest. They're having this illegal questioning in the high priest's palace. Peter was there listening, okay? So now they, in verse 28 of John 18, they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. That means they questioned him all night long. They had to, you, you, ever, see, you ever watch these television shows where they bring these guys into the police station and they try to wear them down? They, start, they keep them up all night long and they ask them questions and back and forth and back and forth. And forth. They, they, they just want to get this person so weary and tired that they're finally just going to tell the truth just to get this thing over with. Well, here they had Jesus in the, the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, all night long. Now, the Bible doesn't record everything they did to him. I don't know what all they did to him there, but I know that he was kept there and asked a lot of questions. So now it's early in the morning. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. But they, that they might eat the Passover. Okay, now, they're getting ready to have the Passover. And here's another problem that comes in. No capital offense trial was to be held the day before the Passover, according to Jewish law. They're not supposed to be holding any kind of a capital offense trial on the, the, the Passover was the great Jewish holiday which commemorated when, when the children of Israel were in Egypt and Moses was to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and he comes to Pharaoh, let my people go and Pharaoh said no and then they had the plagues of the lice and the, and the, and the locusts and all that kind of stuff and finally they got to the final plague where Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and he said no, and then the death angel was going to pass through Egypt that night. And God instructed his people to take a lamb, kill a lamb, take the blood, and put it on the doorposts. And when the death angel passes through Egypt that night, he will pass over all of the homes that have that blood on the door. And the firstborn in every house in the country of Egypt was to die except those people who had the blood marked on the door. And then when the death angel came through, when he saw the blood on the door, the death angel would pass over that door and the firstborn in that house would not die. And that's the, that's the Jewish Passover. That's what they celebrated here. But according to Jewish law, you were not supposed to hold a capital offense trial on the day before the Passover. And here we just read in verse 28, they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. It was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Because you see, it was illegal for them to do that. So if these Jews went in the judgment hall to see what was going to happen when, the, when Jesus was going to be questioned by the Roman authorities, they would have been considered themselves defiled. In other words, they broke the Jewish law by going into a capital offense trial on the day before the Passover, and they wanted to celebrate the Passover. These were Jewish leaders. So they bring Jesus to the judgment hall, and it's almost like knocked on the door and shoved him into the judgment hall, and they didn't, but they didn't go in because they wanted to be able to celebrate the Passover. Look at verse 29. Now, here's Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation bring ye against this man? And they answered and said unto him, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. So see, they, they, they can't answer the question. Pilate says, what did this guy do? Why are you bringing him here? And the Jews said, well, if he, malefactor means criminal. They said, well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't be bringing him before. He wouldn't be bothering you with you. Before. He's obviously done something wrong. Then look at verse 31. Then Pilate said unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. You see what they were doing? They were planting this thought into the Roman minds that Jesus did something that was worthy of death. Because when they brought Jesus before the judgment hall, they told him, said, well, he's a Jew and you're Jews. Why don't you just deal with him according to your Jewish law? Well, they really didn't have anything against him other than the fact they didn't like him and they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. 
So they planted the seed thought into the minds of the Roman government that this guy did something wrong that, and he should be put to death. And that's what they said. They said, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So they're, 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 they're pushing forth this idea that this guy really did something wrong and he really deserves to die. But they didn't tell the Roman authority what he did wrong. So look at verse 32 that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake significantly, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered the judgment hall again, and he called Jesus and said unto him, art thou the king of the Jews? You see who you're getting. He, he's, he's, he's trying to figure out what's going on here. The Jewish authorities didn't really tell Pilate what he did wrong. They planted the idea that he needs to be put to death. But now Pilate's got to figure out, okay, what did this guy do wrong? Why should he be put to death? And Jesus answered him and said, sayest thou this of thyself or did others tell of thee? And Pilate answered, said, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and thy chief priests had delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? You see, he didn't know because they didn't tell him. They just very secretly and very craftily planted the seed thought into his mind that this guy did something worthy of death, but they didn't tell him why. So now Pilate needs to figure, he says, what have you done? And Jesus answered, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus was telling them, this is not the time that I'm going to be the king. If I was a king, don't you think I'd have a bunch of leaders and, and, and army people behind me? And they would have never been able to deliver me in front of the Jews because my fellows would have came in and stopped all this. He said, but I'm not a king, at least not now. Jesus was talking about how that when he comes back the second time is when he becomes the king. And so look at verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. He's starting to get to Pilate, and Pilate is, is seeing who he is. Look at verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Pilate was convinced that there was something really special about Jesus Christ. Just in this short conversation he had with him. Now they delivered him to Pilate, hoping that Pilate would just take the words of the Jewish leaders and go ahead and just put him to death. But Pilate knew he had to, find, he had to figure out what did, what did this man do wrong? What, what, what did he do that would cause me to have to put him to death? He was trying to follow. The, so when he was questioning Jesus and Jesus was answering him, the words of Jesus got into Pilate's heart. And Pilate finally just took him back and, and he stepped outside the judgment hall and he told those Jews, he said, I find in him no fault at all. So now Jesus is taken to Herod of Galilee. Look at Luke chapter 23 and verse five. The gospel of Luke chapter 23 and verse five. So Jesus is called before the high priest questioned all night long in his palace. Then they bring him before Pontius Pilate, trying to get the Roman government to condemn him to death. And now they're gonna bring him to the ruler of Galilee, Herod, in Luke chapter 23 and verse five. And they were more fierce saying, he stirreth up the people, teacheth throughout Jewry, beginning from Galilee unto this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. Now here, get, get the picture of what's going on here. Pilate does not want to condemn Jesus to death because he knows he, doesn't, he can't find anything that he's done wrong. The Jewish leaders are pushing Pilate. They planted that seed thought that this man needs to die. Pilate, in questioning Jesus, finds out that he really didn't do anything wrong. So Pilate takes him back to the Jews and said, I find no fault in this man. And then they told him, said, well, he's been going around from Galilee teaching all this stuff. And Pilate said, oh, oh, wait a minute. Did you say Galilee? Is he a Galilean? And Pilate thinks, oh boy, I could wash my hands of this deal. If he's a Galilean, I'm gonna send him over to Herod because Herod is the ruler of Galilee. See, Pilate wanted to do everything he could to get out of condemning Jesus because he didn't believe he did anything wrong. And as soon as he heard this little tiny piece of information that Jesus was a Galilean, 
Pilate says, oh, okay, fine, then he's not in my jurisdiction. Take him over to Herod. And so they get ready to take him to Herod. Look at verse seven. And as soon as they knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at that time. He was there for the, getting ready for the, for the Passover. You see, when the Jews gathered together, the Roman government was in charge of the whole world. And they didn't want any kind of a ruckus. And when this many Jews were going to gather in Jerusalem for this great Passover feast, you had all the military and the rulers and the governors of the region came by. And Herod was not a Jew. He wasn't in Jerusalem to, to celebrate the Passover. But he was there to keep control because they don't want to have any kind of uprisings. And look at verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. For he had desired to see him a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen him some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Jesus wouldn't talk. He wouldn't defend himself. And look at verse 10. And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war said at naught, mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod made friends together, whereas before they were enemies amongst themselves. So here, you got two guys who normally didn't get along with each other, but you find a common enemy and you'll find two people who normally don't get along with each other, all of a sudden they can get along with each other because now they, they got this third party they're going to turn all their anger on. Well, Herod couldn't find anything to talk to him about and he didn't want to get involved in this thing, so he sends him back to Pilate. So Jesus is taken back to Pilate. Go back to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We're bouncing around here to get the, 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 the flow of the story. So in John chapter 18 and verse 39. John 18, 39. So ye have a custom this is Pilate talking to the Jews. Ye have a custom that I should release one unto you at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? In other words, he goes, you guys have a custom. I can let somebody go free because of the celebration of the Passover. You want me to let this guy go, the king of the Jews? See, Pilate, Pilate wants to get out of this problem. And then they cried all again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. He thought, man, these people are really putting pressure on me. I got to do something. So he took and he started beating Jesus. And the elders platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on a purple robe and said, hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went again and saith unto them, behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said unto him, unto them, behold the man. And when the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, take ye him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. Pilate said, I'm not going to do this. I don't find any legal reason to do it. You want to crucify him? You go ahead and crucify him. Of course, he knew if they did, they would be all in trouble because they weren't the authorities and able to do that. Look at verse 7. And the Jews answered and said, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die because he hath made himself to be the son of God. Once again, that's a problem. Blasphemy was not a capital offense to where you would kill somebody just because they, they blasphemed and said that they were the son of God. Verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard... That saying, he was more afraid. And they went into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus. Now, he goes back. And, now, remember the Jews wouldn't go into the judgment hall because they wanted to be able to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate takes Jesus back into the judgment hall and he says, whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, speakest thou not to me, knowing that I have the power to crucify thee and have the power to release thee? Pilate's getting aggravated. He wants Jesus to defend himself. Answer my questions. Don't you know I have the power to say you're dead and you're gone? And look at verse 11. Jesus answered, thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. 
Well, now the, the Jews are really aggravated. They're wanting to get him crucified. Pilate doesn't want to do it because he can't find anything wrong. Now they put the political pressure onto Pilate. You know, politicians can buckle under pressure. They buckle under the pressure of votes. They buckle under the pressure of a higher authority, maybe getting aggravated with them. So now the Jews are wanting to push Pilate to get Jesus crucified. Pilate keeps saying, I find no fault in him. So now the Jews said, oh, they come up with this brilliant idea. If he says he's the king of the Jews, and there is only one king, the Roman government was in charge of the entire known world at that time. Caesar was the, Caesar was the emperor. So they appealed to Pilate to say, oh, wait a minute. This guy says he's a king, and we know that Caesar is the only king. And Pilate, you're going to allow this man to claim himself to be a king? If you let him do that, you are not Caesar's friend. That's what they said. Uh, in, 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 they said in verse 12, they said, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend, and whosoever maketh him a king speaketh against Caesar. They threatened Pilate to get in trouble with the emperor. And he was nobody to fool with, by the way. And they said, Pilate, if you don't deal with this guy, and this guy's claiming to be a king, and we know we only have one king, therefore we know this guy's got a problem, you need to deal with this, or you are not a friend of Caesar, and we are going to go and tell him what you're doing. Then look at verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus and sat in the judgment seat in a place that's called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, wait a minute. Wait, folks, if those of you who have, who have, who have studied the, 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 the Bible about this story, you know, the Jews hated the Romans. The Roman government came in and took over the entire known world at that time. They took over Israel, they took over Jerusalem, and they were the ones in power. The Jews hated the Roman government. They wanted to get free from the Roman. That's why they thought that a Messiah coming to this earth was going to deliver them from the hands of the wicked, cruel Roman government. But now you see them to, uh, coming up with this, with this crazy statement. The chief priest answered said, we have no king but Caesar. Wait a minute, since when are you gonna give allegiance to Caesar? The, you, the Jewish people hated the, the Romans. They hated Caesar. They hated the oppression. They hated the taxation that was placed upon them and that tax money did not stay in Jerusalem. That tax money did not stay in Israel. That tax money went back to the Roman government. But now, all because they were so angry at Jesus and they wanted him crucified so bad that they wanted to get the Roman government to do it and Pilate wouldn't do it because he couldn't find any problems with him. So they appealed to Pilate's job. You don't do this, we're gonna tell Caesar that you're no friend of Caesar's. And they said, well, and Pilate said, well, you want me to crucify your king? And they said, in the craziest statement you could ever imagine, they said, we have no king but Caesar. Well, since when did they turn around and have allegiance to the Roman government? All of this was a plot to get Jesus crucified, to get him out of the way because they did not believe that he was the Messiah. And then verse 16, then they delivered him therefore to be crucified and they took Jesus and led him away. Now, here's the problem. Here's another problem. If Jesus was found guilty of a Jewish law, and even though what they claimed he was guilty of blasphemy and that doesn't carry a capital offense, but even if they did find something wrong with him where he would need to be put to death, he would have been stoned. That is the Jewish manner of putting a person to death. Crucifixion is a Roman thing. The crucifixion is a public humiliation. Crucifixion, had, the Jews, did you, you look in the history, the Jews never crucified anybody. So if the Jews really wanted to punish Jesus and they wanted him to be put to death, according to Jewish law, he should have been stoned and not crucified but they're calling for the Roman government to crucify him. Why? Because then the Roman government did it and they could wash their hands of this whole thing. Well, then we get to the entombment in Matthew chapter 27. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20. So Jesus is crucified on the cross. 
And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, we read here, Matthew 27, 57. And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who himself made Jesus disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered, and Joseph, taking the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of a rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed was the day of the preparation. The chief priests and the Pharisees came unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. So now they wanna make sure that Jesus stays in that tomb because they heard him teach that even the son of man be crucified three days later, he's gonna rise again. So 64, look at verse 64. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. So the Jews told the, the Roman authorities, they said, you better put a seal on that tomb. He said he was gonna raise from the dead after three days. And knowing those crazy Jews that followed him, they're gonna come here at night, they're gonna open the tomb, steal his body and walk around saying that he's risen, he's risen, he's risen. You better seal the tomb. And look at verse 65. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher, sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So they're gonna, they're gonna seal this thing and they're gonna put Roman guards there and they're gonna make sure that none of the Jews come to steal the body of Jesus and then claim that he rose from the dead. Well, that's good that they put that seal there because that proves all the more that Jesus did rise from the dead because there's no way that anybody was gonna fool a Roman soldier who at the, at the, the, the th threat of his own life, if he was to let somebody get past him and open that tomb. So then at night in Matthew chapter 28, Verse one says, in the end of the Sabbath, it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow for the fear of the keepers did he did shake and become as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, fear ye not for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And so quickly tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you in Galilee, therefore shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and run and did bring disciples the word. We're out of time and I'd like to continue the story, but I just wanted you to see all of the shenanigans that went on during that week prior to Jesus Christ being crucified. The Jews hated him so much because he claimed to be the son of God, but he didn't fit their mold of thinking. You know, today, Jesus Christ doesn't fit the mold of a lot of people's thinking. And therefore they, they discount him as being who he said he was. Just because Jesus doesn't, doesn't do what people expect him to do, or that he is not what they have in their mind, what he should be, that they totally reject him as being the son of God. But after he was crucified and he was buried in that tomb, and that Roman government put that seal on that tomb and set a watch on that tomb. That means they had a guard there the whole time. And the fact that when, in, in the morning on the, of the third day, they came to the tomb, an angel rolled the stone away and they found the tomb empty. Our savior is risen. He has conquered death. And that's what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday morning.